Hi, and welcome to Veganic Gardeners Question Time. My name is Evie B, and I'll be the host for you today. I'll be joined by three wonderful panelists that I'll introduce to you in just a second. Um, and we'll be answering, well, they'll be answering a range of your questions that you've sent in. So I'm just recently adapting to a raw vegan lifestyle. I'm new to the show and I'm also new to growing my own veggies, which I'm going to be starting this spring. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from the experienced gardeners that are on the show and learning learning so much. And I'm so grateful to have found this channel as well. So much uh, important, valuable information on there. I think with everything going on right now, there couldn't be a more important time for us to be transitioning to a more sustainable lifestyle, growing our own food, for the planet, for the animals, for our health. So I'll uh, I'll introduce the panel first of all, and then we'll move on to your questions. Okay, so first of all, we have Jamie Jones. He is a date farmer from California. In 1998, Jamie bought a 22 acre farm in, the, in Southern California. The land is adjacent to a canal, which provides a lot of clean water from the Rocky Mountains via the Colorado River. They have five acres of date palms and the entire property is a, a wildlife refuge. Here's a short video of Jamie in action. <laughs> yeah, man, I treat a vegan way, you know? Cheese on Jesson! Yeah, man, I look at them for your Jesson and Rossat too. Tell them I look at them. All you for kill for eat. For real, King, man. For them say swine and them dinner. So we're not going to know nothing there, you know? And I respect for life Run, here come the butcher man When he come in with his knife I'm more pain, I'm more death I fear murder Life didn't take for them steak and hamburger They raise the plants and seed in the mud Then to take you some flesh in Google's of blood Carnivore, stop fighting it, stop fighting it Hey, give it a life and try You just I'm might get some enlightenment And this the one for the wall of my vegetarians Raw food is and vegans and all the vegetarians Yo, cause I and I now put no dead You know we simple Humbleness, we have to live life simple. To put some food up on the plate. I mean, I need no hook, mean, I need no bait. I unite the roots, me food, me not fish shoots. I give me vegetable and some fruit, make us a no bones, no blood in our kitchen. We're not gonna mix up in a vampire living. No bones, no blood in our kitchen. Cause everything we eat it always positive And everything we drink it never yet negative You are what you eat, that's why you walk like pig You are what you eat, that's why you walk like pig You treat your body round your own a grave, you a dish Yo, don't panic, cause I'm all organic Pure soy soup in a me kitchen, yes, I got it Yo, don't panic, cause I'm all organic Lentil peas in a me soup, I got it Yo, don't panic, cause I'm all organic Vegan life, me live on none of them, can't stop it Yes, me got dead. Ready for go boil it and stop. No bones, no blood in our kitchen. We not gonna mix up in a vampire living. No bones, no blood in our kitchen. Say Rasta Fara, you're my greatest ambition. No bones, no blood in our kitchen. Me synchronize with the most high's vision. No bones, no blood in our kitchen. Come on, let's play. I'm a vampire. Tell them nice and low. And the butter we cook in a natural earth Off with the dinner Tell them no bones, no flesh no. Alright, yes natural earth Off with the dinner Hey, the high tell is high Tell them no butter we cook in a natural earth Off with the dinner We got them on a loot and fire Tell them root, strong back And sassy perilla Root, orange, mango and guava Vegetable salad With peanut and gaso With some clean drinking water some strong marijuana True. Yes, they know that I'm a mama Hey, the food that I eat is my medicine Tell them I'm a real booster Cleanse them with garlic and bitters I now go dunk and rum filthy liquors Go tell them marijuana make me 
slippers No pork tops in our flitters No bones, no blood in our kitchen We not gonna mix up in our vampire living No bones, no blood in our kitchen Jamie, welcome to the show. I have Hi. a whole new appreciation for my love of dates now. That's just incredible. The height of that, like, amazing, amazing. They grow so tall, those trees. So, yeah. um, anything you wanted to add to your introduction? Um, no, I think you covered it pretty good. Uh, I'm ready to go with the first question. Oh, great. Oh, thank you for joining us all the way from California. We look forward to hearing from you. Okay, I'll introduce the next panelist then. Next we have Aranya. Aranya is a permaculture teacher and author of Permaculture Design, a step-by-step -step guide. He launched an online course this summer based on well, the last summer based on the design process described in the book. Currently he's finishing a second book about the application of systems thinking and patterns on permaculture design, due to be published this year. He's been gardening for 35 years and is especially interested in low input systems like forest gardening and no dig. Oh, we don't seem to have your face there, Aranya. Can you can you hear us at least? Don't think so. Okay, we'll um, just wait for Aranya's Wi-Fi signal to, to be a bit better and then we'll move on and introduce the next panelist, which is Piers, who's also been on the show as well as Aranya. So Piers is Piers Warren, con conservationalist, author and keen grower of organic fruit and vegetables. He is the founder of Wild Eye, the international school of wild, wildfire film sorry wildfire filmmaking writer of several books and co-author of the vegan cookbook and gardener hi appears and welcome back to the show you've been a panelist on the show before look forward to um speaking to you today have you anything you wanted to add to that how's the how's the books coming on <clears throat> oh you're muted peers how can that be we've got a, a short clip to show for you as well haven't we so how are you getting on can you hear me now yes we can hear you oh okay so um yes good i've been, I've been <laughs> this week i've been eating potatoes and onions that i grew last year but having seen jamie's amazing video i'd rather be eating dates with him in california oh i know right his his work with that ladder was amazing <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so much skill involved in that. And at yeah. the end as well, to even put the ladder back on the truck. Like, yeah. amazing. And so yeah. much appreciation. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a short clip for, for you, Piers, as well, haven't we? We'll show that now. Yep. Okay. The Vegan Organic Network are pleased to announce a brand new section on our website called Garden Advice. Here you'll find an introduction to vegan organic growing with practical tips on soil fertility, compost, mulching, green manures, crop rotation and dealing with weeds and pests. There's a section growing throughout the year with links to pages for each month covering what to sow, plant out, harvest, store and other jobs on the plot. With separate sections on salad leaves and herbs, we hope you find this new resource useful. Find it via veganorganic.net. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Piers. Is there anything else you wanted to share before we get on with the questions? Well, just that that, that section, the video was about, um, I've, I've just finished creating that for the Vegan Organic Network website. And uh, the, the reason was because we already had a farm advice section and we wanted to add a garden advice section for people who were just growing at home or in their allotment, which is what I do and what I write about. So, um, yeah, we hope people find that useful. 
Oh, and I'm sure they will. So many people are getting interested in this now that haven't been before. So, um, yeah, I'll see a whole new influx of people, I think, uh, this spring, including myself, who's going to be starting to grow their own veggies and get allotments and things. So, OK, we'll move on with the first question. Oh, and we have Aranya. Hooray. Hooray, you're with us. Can you hear me as well? Yes, we can. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good, yeah. The test, yeah, all things good. good. Yeah, I, I was fine. The machinery is... Anyway, here I am. <laughs> Great. Okay, then. Should we move on to the first question? Yes. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Mycorrhizal... <laughs> this is a tough word for me, this. Mycorrhizal <laughs> fungi. What are they and what do they do and how can I add them to my garden? And that's from Albert in East Suffolk. Who would like to answer the first question? Piers, I think were you cracking in with that one first? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I can just I, I can tell you what they are, and then perhaps around here can tell us more about his experience of, of actually um, using them. So, um, basically, as you know, fungi have fruiting bodies, which is what we see as the mushrooms and toadstools, but most of the action is going on underneath in the soil and with these strands of um, mycorrhizal fungi. And the reason that they're important for us is because that they have uh, an, a relationship. It's a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship with um, other plants, uh, especially long-lived plants like trees and shrubs, which includes a lot of the fruit stuff that we grow, perennials as well. And basically, the mycorrhizal fungi, which are very, very fine white roots, they connect um, up with the, the roots of trees and shrubs and other plants. And they enable the surface area to increase so that uh, water and nutrients will flow into the roots faster and at a larger quantity. And in return, they get sugars, simple carbohydrates from the roots of the plant. So they're feeding from the plants while they're giving the plants extra um, water and nutrients. There are two types of these fungi. One of them actually grows around the outside of the fine root hairs of the plant. And then there's another one which actually grows inside the root and it goes in between the cells of the root and performs the a, a, a same sort of function though. So they're really important for the um, health and vigor of uh, plants and trees. Um, and of course, if you disturb soil, you disturb them and this relationship, which is another reason why it's good to have a no dig uh, method of gardening. Uh, but now let's go over to Aranya for some uh, practical advice. Well, that was, that was brilliant, Piers. Um, so in practice, when do we need to, of course, one of the, you may not need to add them. If, you're, if your garden has a close edge to a hedge or some trees, they may already be in the soil. As Piers says, that if you disturb the soil, if you're using uh, cultivation tools, you're breaking up the network. And so obviously uh, sort of a more no dig approach is better, but, also, if we're looking at the process of succession in nature, if we're looking to maybe put a tree into what was previously a lawn, there's a strong likelihood that you don't have mycorrhizal fungi, or at least not the kinds that the woodier plants and trees like uh, you know, shrubs and so on would like. So there are, so the one type that Piers was talking about can or do make relationships with perennial grasses but then there's some other kinds that would connect in with trees and shrubs so in that situation if you're putting a tree into your lawn for instance a fruit tree or something then you may well need to add them and um, my preferred way of doing it because you can buy you, you can make your own but really that's sort of a level up that once you've got a, a sense of how it works then you might go to that um, but usually we go and we buy what's called a mycorrhizal inoculant which you can buy in a packet um, the most familiar one is root grow, but my favourite is called fungus, uh, Chaos Fungorum, and it's a collection of 
edible species of mycorrhizal mushroom. So you you support your shrub or your tree that you're planting, but you also hopefully at some point get some edible fruit or mushrooms. And uh, and my favourite way of giving them or uh, putting them into the tree guild, into the tree system, rather than just applying them as a kind of it's like a little gritty powder that you can apply it's how you buy it is to grow a perennial onion so any of those kind of classic chives or more unusual ones garlic chives and so on in a pot with the mycorrhiza and then so by the time you get to the winter so that's something you would do towards the end of the summer months by the time you get to the winter you've got little pots of these onions which already have mycorrhiza in the soil and you just plant that with your tree so, but yes, highly recommended because really important relationship between plants and fungi, which ultimately, you know, if we're eating those vegetables or fruit or leaves, then the nourishment comes to us and it comes through the fungus, through the trees sort of thing. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Aranya. Thank you, Piers, as well. Great answers there, really detailed. I'm sure that will help um, Albert and anyone else as well. OK, we'll move on to question two. Um, and this comes from Val Badger. I had good crop of onions last year. They were dried and hung in our airy frost-free frost shed, but some of them have started to rot. It has happened on occasion in previous years, but I don't know why. Does anyone have any advice, please, on how to stop this happening again in the future? Well, well, I can, oh, I can um, yeah, well, Val, it does sound like you are doing all the right things. So, of course, it's quite hard to guess what the problem is. You do say you dried the onions, but it may be that they weren't quite dry enough when they went into, into storage. So I'll just quickly run through how I do it, and, and maybe you can pick up something from that. So starting with exhibit here, um, I'm not showing off, but look at the size of that one. Grown from <laughs> seed last year. So this was um, a seed that I sowed probably around March, April time, and then harvested around August, September time. So it's already five months, at least since it's been harvested. And it's, it's sound and firm and will probably go for another month or two, or, or who knows. Um, until I start harvesting the spring onions of this year. So onions are a relatively easy thing to be self-sufficient for. So my technique is simply grow them until um, around August or September, depending on the weather conditions and where you live, until you see that the tops of the onions here uh, turn brown and flop over. And once you've reached that point, they're not really going to grow much more. So keep an eye on the weather. And especially if you see a week or two of hot, dry weather ahead, then that's the time to lift them. So you simply pull them up, wipe any um, soil that's sticking to the underside off and set them on the ground. I often set them on something like a, a netting so that I can easily collect them up if rain is coming and i although some people only leave them to dry for a few days i leave them for a couple of weeks minimum and ideally just outside lying in the sun but if there is rain then i collect them up and i take them inside and i usually store them in crates which have kind of open mesh sides so there's plenty of air flow and uh, i'll put them in either a cool greenhouse with plenty of ventilation or um, a shed. Uh, this, is, this is if rain is coming, so they can continue to dry out. And after a couple of weeks, you should feel that they're very dry and the, uh, the skin around it is very papery. And then at that point, then you can either hang them up uh, on strings uh, in a cool, airy, frost free place as you say um, or actually sometimes I, I just leave them in these um, mesh sided crates piled on top of each other and um, that works pretty well. It was interesting that this last year I grew onions from sets that I sowed much earlier in the year 
and they didn't do nearly as well as these that I grew from seeds in March, April. So that was very interesting. It's the first time that's happened to me. So this is the most successful uh, onions that I've grown. So I'm certainly going to be using that method more in the future. So hope some of that helps. I'm sure that will. They are very impressive onions. Thank you, Piers. OK, we'll move on to question three. OK, this one. Hello, my question is to do with so-called hydroponic systems. My daughter recently started volunteering at a community project in the Liverpool area. She was telling me about the lettuce that had grown there in a vertical system using only water. What does the panel think about this method of growing? Okay, so that <laughs> yeah, so these, these hydro, hydroponic and aeroponic systems are, are really great and, and they're a lot of fun, especially good for people who don't have a lot of space. I mean, you can even use them on, a, in, on the balcony of your apartment or inside under lights even. Um, so, yeah, and they, they grow really fast, faster than what they would grow if you planted it in the ground. Uh, plus, it looks really cool. They're beautiful. And uh, uh, it, it's going to be educational. Um, downside is you got to plug them in because they got a pump that circulates the water through them constantly. And it, it, the other thing is they can be kind of expensive. But, you know, the value of the produce that you grow will, will soon outweigh any initial investment you put in there. So they're definitely worth it. And uh, as, then we factor in the, 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 the health benefits of eating that super fresh produce like that. Uh, you're going to be way ahead. I really like the, the, the tower gardens and because uh, you can walk right up to them and you can graze your, your lettuce <laughs> right off the living plants. And uh, so it doesn't get any fresher than that. Um, but uh, for your community garden, probably not best to do that, especially in these times. But uh, as long as you got your own system at home and the neighbors aren't watching, go for it. Uh, the other thing is uh, the um, you're going to need nutrients. Um, now, if you're going to do it organically, there are a couple places that sell the veganic hydroponic nutrients. And one of them is the Organica Garden Supply. So you can get the veganic nutrients right from them, mail order. Um, or you might want to create your own. Uh, just uh, you have to experiment, you know, with whatever, whatever you want to use. And uh, so you're going to need something like that. Um, yeah, so they're really they're really great. And, you know, I highly recommend them. Personally, you know, I, I prefer a pack of seeds and a plot of ground. Some old fashioned. <laughs> but um, but they're a really good option. The, the, the tower gardens are, and hyponic systems are great. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the great question there. That came in from Richard. So I hope that's answered your question okay there. Okay, so question four. These, uh, she sent in two questions actually um, from Melanie in Australia. Question one, I believe that, that with uh, cover crops, we can periodically mow, cut them back to add residual to the soil, chop and drop, while green manures are meant to be dug in a little into the soil. Is one method more beneficial than the other? Any examples of plants that best best be left onto the soil surface versus others that best be incorporated in? Who would like to answer this question? Iranya. Oh yeah, unmute. Um, yes, there's two sort of different things going on here. So I think the, it's important to think about the difference between an annual garden where you're growing your annual veg. And uh, in that sense, that sometimes we think, oh, perennials are better, but actually a lot of the things that we eat that we nourish ourselves with and we love to eat are annuals. Um, and in that situation, very often we're using things like green manures um, and yeah, people chop and drop those and often they'll be dug in. Now I'm a no dig person, so I'm not really that, I don't do that sort of thing. What, what I'm always trying to do is to always fill the space with something and of course, some of the things we can grow, like legumes, your peas and your beans and so on, if you cut them off and leave the roots in the soil, you're leaving a dose of nitrogen uh, behind. I think the chop and drop system really is more to do with perennials. So if you've got plant, you know, trees and shrubs and so on, a perennial system, your fruit bushes and your fruit trees, and to have so a classic kind of chop and drop plant, 
might be comfrey, for instance, or you could even say plants like mint or those those kind of families, uh, nettles, if you don't mind a bit of glove work, because they're, they're good accumulators of minerals from deeper down in the soil. And by chopping and dropping, you're basically uh, connecting a pump of minerals from deep down in the ground up to the surface of the soil and then delivering them around the plants um, and your trees, so trees often have feeder roots close to the surface because they're designed to absorb as much as possible of the nutrients from the leaves before they drop them, they're deciduous trees, um, but then there's still nutrients in the leaves, so they put the feeder roots close to the surface to collect those the remaining nutrients from those leaves as they're breaking down again. So if you're chopping and dropping plants around the tree as well, that's one great way of feeding them. And it's uh, a lovely way of also competing, out competing the grass that you might have in a system like that. So mint and comfrey and so on, they can be quite vigorous plants and uh, you always want to be managing them to some degree, but you've got that balance of if something's vigorous, it's also productive. So plants like that are actually great to have in the system as long as you're going on interacting with them. So in our forest garden that we had before, and we've just recently moved last year, um, then we had, there was quite a lot of comfrey around and I would just chop and drop it and scoop some of the comfrey close to the trees a couple of times a, a year in the summer months. And that's all we did. And the trees were very happy because they were, the grass was out competed, the comfrey was growing well, and the trees got a dose of that from time to time. So green manures um, and some green, green manures are more difficult than others. Things like perennial rye, once they get in there, they're quite a job to get rid of. So I wouldn't be leaving um, green leaves as such on the surface of an annual bed. I would go with what Charles Dowding says is, you know, the more of that you leave around, the more you attract the slugs. So to just use finished compost on your annual beds, but by, by all means do lots of chopping and dropping around your perennials and your trees and shrubs and so on. You're muted, Evie. Oh, <laughs> oh, here we are. If anyone wants to add anything to any of the questions, just let me know. Otherwise, we'll, I'll move on so we can get through as many as we can in the next 15 minutes or so. So are we ready for our question five? Okay, and this comes in from Mel Melanie as well. Compost teas, what are methods to, one, make it com composition, brewing time, sugar type, etc and two, apply it, application, device, and method, timing, et cetera, which depending on small versus larger surface areas, e.g. small backyard, backyard versus grazing paddock. Are there any other alternatives to compost tea to quickly regenerate a soil? Who would like to take this question? I'm happy with that one. <laughs> It's, it. it's a lot in that question. There was, yeah. I'll say a few things and then if anyone else wants to add anything. So compost teas, really, they're about getting microbes back into the soil. So a lot of the things we might make, you've probably come across that, you know, put nettles or comfrey in a big bat, bat full of water and it gets really smelly, and but the plants love it. That's about basically getting the nutrients to the plants. You're feeding the plants, whereas a compost tea, you're breeding microbes you're taking a small amount of compost, which will never cover the size of the garden you have. Um, and you're saying, okay, the soil needs more microbes because it's degraded in some way. So this might be land that you've taken on from some other system. So the land is knackered and it needs some microbes in order to eat the organic matter that you're trying to give the soil to feed the life. But if there's no microbes to eat it, then you can't grow plants, if that makes sense. So your compost tea is you get a little bit of your compost, your finished compost, which is hopefully full of microbes, and you give it, its, uh, you basically give those microbes all they need to breed more. So lots of water, lots of sugar. So it's usually some kind of cheap sugar like molasses and uh, aeration as well, because then you're breeding the right kind of microbes. You want aeration, aerated, you know, aerated bacteria rather than anaerobics or aer aerobic rather than anaerobic bacteria because that's what you want your soil to be like. That's the sweet smelling stuff. And uh, and you basically give them a big party. And after eight to 12 hours, your tank or your bucket, depending on the size you're working at, should be full of saturated with microbes. And then you've got to get them into the soil before they all die again. So 
it's there's lots of recipes for this and there's uh, books on this there's a really nice book of permanent publications about compost teas that's the permaculture association people um but i say rather than getting into the recipes it's just be clear that your soil needs microbes and that's what a compost tea is to do and really it's a one-off application i wouldn't be thinking of applying it on a regular basis now if you've got an orchard you might be wanting to apply something similar to the leaves of your apple trees to sort of coat the the leaves and get a good uh, bacterial colony on those leaves but as um generally if you're talking about soil i'd say ideally a one-off um and it's just it's a quite specific uh technique for a particular problem if that makes sense awesome thank you for that Iranya. does anyone want to add anything to that should we move on to the next question okay question six this comes from hillary what are the tallest perennial veg that will grow without a greenhouse? <laughs> Who can answer this question for Hillary? Anyone? Any takers? <laughs> I would say. <laughs> I don't know, maybe uh, uh, the um, uh, the, for maybe the artichoke. Yeah, I'm not sure what's the tallest. You know, I, I'm I really not not sure about that artichoke. I, I would imagine that they get huge. It, it was tastiest. Oh, tastiest. <laughs> okay, I got it. I got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I, I can answer that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm so sorry. Okay, I, I got it. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, I, I just want to say that you know, uh, perennials are great, you know, because uh, you just plant them once and these keep coming back. And uh, they, they used to come early because uh, they, they feel that hunger gap, as they call it, in the early season when maybe other stuff isn't available. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so some of the best ones are um, asparagus, uh, artichokes. Uh, rhubarb, shallots, a couple types of onions you can use, like an Egyptian onion. Uh, there's everlast for greens, you get everlasting kale, uh, perennial spinach. Um, then you got the herbs, you know, you got the uh, peppermint, valerian, comfrey, thyme, oregano. And uh, yeah, and then don't forget the, you know, the really tasty the things are, are like the berries, you know, you got the strawberries and the blackberries, the gooseberries. Uh, so yeah, all, all that stuff is, is really good. Um, uh, so yeah, you know, uh, if I could paraphrase uh, one of my guardian heroes, the, uh, you know, uh, 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 how's that go? I've got, <laughs> I'm trying to remember how it goes now. Uh, uh, gardening is cheaper than therapy. Uh, plus, you get strawberries. So, yeah, the perennials are great. So it was just that that very card is on the side in my office. <laughs> Slightly uh, different version. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I would add one more, uh, which is yacon. I don't know if people are familiar with yacon, mm -hmm. but it's a really lovely plant. So you don't need a greenhouse to grow it, but you do need to put it somewhere over the winter because it doesn't like frost. You have to basically dig it up, take the tubers off, store it somewhere, and then plant it again the following spring after the last frost. Oh, thank you both. Liz, did you want to add anything? No. Nope. Okay, okay, we'll move on to the next question. Thank you for that great question. Sorry about that mix up with the word there. Okay, so question seven from Peter. I've been reading up about how to get the best crop from the asparagus crowns that I planted last year. I read that I should have dressed them with compost in the winter. I can't help thinking that had I done, I would 
I would have had all the goodness be washed out of the compost over the winter months. I intend to weed when, when the soil is dry enough and dress up with some compost. What do you think is the best option? Plus, do you have any other tips? I can go with that. So, um, actually, before I talk about asparagus, just very quickly, someone in the chat asked, what variety is this onion? And the answer is it's Ailsa Craig. That's A-I-L-S-A -S -S Craig. It's uh, very common to find uh, seeds of that variety, so you'll easily find them in any any catalogue. So Ailsa Craig. Anyway, asparagus. So, Peter, you talk about worrying that if you mulch in the winter, which is, is recommended for asparagus, that all the goodness will be washed away. Well, the two main reasons for mulching in the winter is to discourage weeds and to retain moisture in the soil. So it's not really a matter of worrying about the goodness. So that, that's why we do it. Um, the other reason is, of course, that uh, organic matter from the compost will be pulled into the soil by worms and other creatures and that will improve the quality of the soil because asparagus does like a, a free drainage so any amount of organic matter you can get in there um, is to the benefit. Now asparagus roots uh, once they're a bit more established they're pretty close to the surface so you do want to be careful about weeding uh, when you do weed, I'd, I'd be very wary about using a hoe. It'd be better to hand weed them. But hopefully if you're adding enough mulch, you, you, you will have very little weeding to do anyway. So the routine is usually to mulch it uh, end of autumn, winter time, nice thick layer of mulch, weeds down, moisture in. And then when you get to the early spring, say about March time, that's when you want to be thinking about feeding them. And uh, you can feed them with a, a liquid seaweed feed or a plant tea or uh, bearing in mind that asparagus are hungry for phosphorus. They really like phosphorus. So something comfrey based would be good for that. And if you haven't got your own uh, comfrey tea that you've made, uh, you can buy the concentrate and you can buy it as pellets as well, comfrey pellets. You can also buy veganic pellets of a variety of other plants that you can just spread around the, the surface of the soil. And again, the rain and the invertebrates will, will bring it into the soil to the roots. So that's what I recommend. Great, thank you. I hope that's answered your question. Let's we'll move on to question eight then. And we're just short of time. Hopefully we'll get through them all. So question eight comes in from Ava. Thank you for this amazing opportunity to learn veganic gardening. I have a goal to move to a slightly more tropical climate in which I intend to live off my own home grown food. In the meantime, I have an elm tree that is elm tree that is feeling stressed and dropping her branches that come into contact with the neighbor's tree and also sprouting all over the entire garden, including the house foundation. I do not want to use poisons. Do you know what I can do to help her? Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> Go for it. Very, uh, very beautiful trees. Of course, we don't really see them anymore in their false beauty. Um, I grew up with a row of elm trees opposite when I was a lot younger. And then, of course, we had Dutch elm disease. And it's to do with, the, there's a beetle that basically infects the trees. And they're still not quite sure whether it's just when they flower or when they get to a certain height. But essentially, they never get to be fully full-size trees anymore. So they grow so far and then they die. But what they also do is they sucker. So they put roots out close to the surface and then keep putting up little trees. And they're attached to the root system. So. If you're wanting to deal with that in your garden, um, what you really want to do is kind of look at are the lines of these little saplings coming up that are going in the direction of where the tree is. Um, because what you can do is go along and just pull up. If you start working, teasing around them, you'll sort of pull it up and you'll see there's a root attached and then that goes back and there's another one. And if you just trace it all the way back and cut it off there, then essentially that's the best way of dealing with them so they'll be attached to the main tree 
um, but there's not really much you can do because all the time the tree is alive, it's going to carry on trying to sucker because that's its way of surviving is to make new little trees. So um, yeah, that's what I would say really about that. Great, thank, thank you, you for that. that. Hope that, that helps. Okay, anyone else? To move on to question nine. Okay, question nine comes in from John in Cornwall. Is it possible to live as self-sufficiently as a gatherer without hunting? And how much area of land would you need for that? Any takers for this question from John? Uh, I'm always happy to have a go. <laughs> Back to Iran, yeah. um, being sort of being a permie, I would immediately say, okay, so he's in Cornwall. He actually says John in Cornwall, which is the start, isn't it? We live in Cornwall. I think Britain is quite a tough place to live as a you know sort of a forager without doing the hunting thing. I think that's obviously why people when they got here, and to some degree maybe people were pushed out of the nicer landscapes as the population increased. And those of us, you know, our ancestors who got here really were the unluckiest ones. <laughs> and they then had to work out how do we live here? So we developed they developed technologies to keep themselves alive. And that would have included you know, tools and hunting and that kind of thing. So I'm feeling that it's not the great, you know, it's not the easiest place to live as a forager, but we do have this amazing collection of plants and vegetables and fruit trees and so on that our ancestors also bred all these varieties of things that they never had. So life is much easier for us now than it was. Um, but I think as to live just foraging in this climate without doing, you know, as a vegan would be quite a challenge, I think. Um, I did my best. Well, we still go. I tried in Southwest Ireland and we did garden as well. And that was still quite a challenge. So, um, yeah, yeah, I would go. Most people go somewhere warmer. <laughs> Oh, great answer. Thank you for that, Iranya. We have one more question and we are approaching the 45 minutes now, but if we go over this quickly, we'll just fit this in. This is from another Evie um, in Eastbourne. And she asks, she says, for quite a while now, I have been getting a bag of organic compost from the organic gardening catalogue, but firm in for the past, past few years. When I plant my squash, courgette and sweet corn seeds, there is this little fly that lays eggs in the seeds. So they just rot. And when you rummage in the soil, it's full of maggots. It's, so it's near impossible to grow any plants with large seeds. How can I avoid this? Can anyone help Evie? <laughs> Piers, you muted. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can, I can only assume that these um, flies come as eggs inside the, the, the bag of compost. You know, they're not going to, they're not going to come with the seeds. So, um, and I, I have experienced this before, and the only solution was to change to a different type of compost. So, um, yeah, make, you know, make, make notes of the, the types of compost that you're using and which ones you have trouble with. And probably go back to where you got it from and explain you've had this this problem. You might even get a free bag of different compost out of them. But um, yeah, that that's my only solution. Oh, wonderful! Thank you, everyone. And we've just hit the forty-five minutes. It was perfect timing. Thank you all for having me on the show, <laughs> and um, thank you for answering the question so wonderfully. So we'll conclude there. Anyone who's been watching and wants to know more information, check out the website, Vegan Organic Network. Um, and obviously there's the YouTube channel and Facebook. Keep sending in your questions and we'll be back soon to answer more of your questions. Thank you everyone and take care, Bye. <laughs> Many thanks to our panel and to you for watching. Please support and join us on our veganic mission to be part of a worldwide movement for a peaceful, just world where agriculture is earth, animal and human friendly.